Hi everybody, Dr. Aulis here. In this short video, we're going to talk about the way that light travels through the eye, as well as the ways that we modify it, and what can go wrong with some of those modifications. So let's start with a quick reminder of the way that light passes through the eye, using some of those structures that we talked about in the previous video. Remember that the clear front part of your eyeball is called the cornea, and this is the first structure that light has to pass through in order for it to get into the eyeball. The cornea is really important for bending light waves. In particular, the cornea is bending those waves so that they'll pass through the pupil. Now remember when we talked about the pupil that this was just an opening or it was a hole in the colored part of your eyeball called the iris. So the cornea bends light waves so that they'll pass through that pupil so they can get into the deeper parts of the eyeball. Just behind the pupil is the structure called the lens. And the lens is my second structure that really works on bending the light waves. In fact, when the lens bends the light waves, its goal is to focus them onto that back layer of, of the eyeball called the retina. Remember that the retina is where we find those cells that actually help us to perceive those light waves. When light is coming into the eyeball, there are two ways that, that we can adjust it. We need to decide how much light is getting into the eyeball, which is what we'll talk about first. And what we'll talk about in a moment is the way that I focus that light onto the retina. So let's start with a discussion of how I control how much light gets into my eyeball. Inside the pupil, or excuse me, inside the iris, there are two layers of muscle. We have what are called the circular muscles that frame around that pupil, and we also have what are called the radial muscles. And the radial muscles are more on the outside of that circle. These two sets of muscles do two very different things. So let's start with the innermost circular muscles. When the innermost circular muscles contract, the size of the pupil or the opening of your eyeball actually gets smaller. Making your pupil smaller is something that your eyes automatically do when you walk outside and there's bright light or you go from a dark bedroom into a light hallway. Your pupil automatically gets smaller by contracting the circular muscles. This is also though an action that our parasympathetic nervous system does for us. We're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system in our next chapter, but the short thing for you to write down right now about the parasympathetic nervous system is this is rest and digest. After we've eaten a big meal, we're ready to start digesting our food, we really don't need a lot of light information to come in. We just kind of want to relax, maybe take a nap, so we'll contract our circular muscles Remember, when those contract, the size of the pupil shrinks, it gets smaller. Compare that though to the radial muscles. The radial muscles are found on the outside of the iris. When the radial muscles contract, they actually pull the pupil larger. So by stretching out uh, the muscle fibers in the circular layer, the pupil ends up getting bigger. This is what we automatically do when light is dim. So when you're in a dark room for an extended period of time, your pupils will enlarge. They'll also enlarge though when we activate the sympathetic nervous system. Right now, I want you to write down next to sympathetic, fight or flight. The sympathetic nervous system is what kicks into gear when you're walking in an alley at night and you start to hear footsteps. We want to take in as much visual information as possible. By making our pupil larger, that will allow us to do that. So keep in mind, your eyes decide how much light comes in. If we don't need very much light to come in, we'll contract our circular muscles in the middle. If we need a lot of light to come in, we'll contract the radial muscles more toward the outside. So step number one, we're regulating the amount of light that gets into the eyeball. Step number two, we're regulating how that light is focused onto the retina. 
to help our light waves get to the retina, we're going to change the shape of the lens inside the eyeball. Changing the shape of the lens is something called accommodation. When we are looking at something that's far away compared to something that's up close, we have to change the shape of our lens to be able to do that. So let's start with looking at something that's far away. When I look at something that's far away, when the light waves reach my eye, notice that they're coming in in a pretty flat angle. So when light waves come in at a flat angle, I don't have to bend them as much to get them to focus more on the backside, on the retina of the eye. Because they're coming in at, at this flat angle and I don't have to work on them, I'll actually relax my ciliary muscles. Remember the ciliary muscles pulled on the lens and changed its shape. When the ciliary muscles relax, they spread up and down in the eye, which means they pull on the lens. Their little fibers stretch that lens out. What I want you to write next to your note about distant vision, I want you to write long and lean. Long and lean. What I mean by that is my lens gets stretched out so that it's very long. And when I use the word lean, I mean that it's not very thick. It's pretty, pretty skinny. So when you're looking at something that's far away, we stretch out your lens as long as possible to help focus those light waves onto the retina. When we look at something up close though, notice how those light waves come in at more of an angle. And when they're coming in at more of an angle, I'm gonna have to bend them a little bit more to still get them to focus on the retina. If I need those light waves to bend a little bit more to get where they're supposed to go, I have to contract my ciliary muscles. When I contract the ciliary muscles, these are a circle and they squeeze in toward that lens. What I want you to write next to close vision is I want you to write short and stout, like the little teapot, short and stout. When I'm looking at something up close, I'm gonna squeeze my lens all the way in so it's not gonna be long and skinny anymore. It's gonna be a whole lot shorter and it's gonna bulge toward the front and the back. That allows me to focus my light where it needs to go. Now here's an important big picture idea that I want you to write down somewhere near this slide. Here's what I need you to write down somewhere around here. For you to perceive light, it has to be focused on the retina. For you to perceive light, it has to be focused on the retina. Whether I have to make my lens long and lean to focus the light waves on the retina, or whether I need to make it short and stout to focus the light waves on the retina. Either way, whatever I have to do to get them onto the retina, I will do that. Because if my light waves are focused anywhere else, I will not be able to perceive them. So on that note, considering that light has to be focused on the retina, let's talk about some common vision disorders. Here's a theme that we'll see throughout all of the vision disorders. For each of these, light is not going to be focused on the retina. And remember, if I don't focus it on the retina, I can't see it. So let's start with a very common vision disorder called myopia. Myopia is the fancy scientific name for nearsighted. Nearsighted, meaning you can see things up close, but you can't see things far away. When we are looking at what causes myopia, what causes nearsightedness, this is an issue with the shape of the eyeball. So with myopia, individuals have an eyeball that's too long. Instead of being a circle, like a normal eyeball, uh, my optometrist once described this to me, your eyeball's more like a football shape 
where it's elongated. Instead of being a circle, it's more like a football. So if the eyeball is longer than normal, light waves come in through the cornea, they pass through the pupil, the lens bends them to where the retina would normally be, but the retina isn't there. The retina is actually back farther. So by the time the light waves get to the retina, they're no longer focused, leading to blurry vision. So individuals with myopia, individuals with nearsightedness, like your instructor, have to use what are called concave lenses. Concave lenses have this little caving in shape here in the back. The goal of this caving in shape is to make all of the light waves travel farther into the eyeball back to where the retina is located. So myopia, the, the common name for this being nearsightedness, in this disorder, the eyeball is too long we have to treat it with lenses that make the light waves travel farther into the eyeball. Let's talk about what might be considered the opposite disorder from myopia, and that's hyperopia. When we talk about hyperopia, this is also known as farsightedness. Farsightedness meaning you can see things far away, but you can't see them up close. When we talk about hyperopia, again, this is an issue with the shape of the eyeball. But this time, our eyeball isn't too long. This time, the eyeball is too short. So the eyeball is squeezed more toward the front, meaning that when the cornea and the lens focus the light where it normally would find the retina, the retina is not there. The light waves that hit the retina aren't quite focused yet, leading to blurry vision. Now notice, in individuals with hyperopia, with farsightedness, we actually use a different shape of lens. We use what's called a convex lens. The goal of a convex lens is to make the light waves not travel as far as they would have. So a convex lens brings those light waves closer to the front of the eyeball, allowing us to perceive them even when the retina is farther forward than would normally be expected. There is a disorder called presbyopia that is very similar to hyperopia, but it's different in a very important way. When we talk about presbyopia, I want you to write down somewhere on this slide that this is also known as age-related farsightedness. Age-related farsightedness. Or in other words, this is why when we all grow up, we need reading glasses. So this question here asks, who's most affected by presbyopia? Well, the, the not politically correct way to say it is old people. I can only say that because I am almost an old person myself. So everyone in your lifetime will develop some level of presbyopia. It typically starts between the ages of 35 to 45 and continues throughout the rest of your life. Let's talk about why presbyopia is something that everyone will develop. Reason number one is as we age, our lens gets harder. It's just something that naturally happens with time. So instead of being able to easily go long and lean or short and stout, that lens has gotten harder. As it mentions here, the power of accommodation, the ability to change shape goes down. That's problem number one. Problem number two though, is that the ciliary body, those muscles that pull on the lens to try to make it long and lean or short and stout, those muscles are getting weaker. So not only is the thing that I need to change the shape of uh, harder to change, the muscles that I would be using to do that are also weaker. So presbyopia, age-related farsightedness. You can see things far away, but you can't see things up close. Because remember, when you see things up close, we have to squeeze that lens into a little shape to allow us to focus the light waves. 
One final vision disorder that I want to introduce you to is something called astigmatism. Astigmatism is a little bit different from the other disorders because this isn't an issue with the shape of the eyeball as a whole. So in hyperopia, our eyeball was too short. In myopia, the eyeball was too long. Well, when we're talking about astigmatism, this is actually an issue with the shape of the cornea. So when your cornea is normal shaped, it's shaped kind of like a sphere. It's very rounded. But in an individual with astigmatism, the cornea is more oval shaped. This is problematic because having that nice sphere shape allows us to focus our light waves all in one location, one focal point. When the cornea is an oval, we actually focus those light waves in more than one location. And those locations may or may not actually be on the retina itself. So when I describe what astigmatism is, I kind of like to say it's not farsighted, it's not nearsighted, it's just everything is equally blurry because none of those light waves are being focused at the same location. So here's the most important thing I want you to take away from all of the vision disorders. Astigmatism and all our other opias. I want you to know that the way that all of these disorders are the same is that it's a problem with focusing the light waves on the retina. Whether I focus the light waves on multiple different locations that may or may not be the retina, or whether I focus the light waves in front of the retina or behind the retina, it doesn't matter. Every single time that I want to see something, for me to be able to see it, I must focus those light waves on the retina. That's what makes all of these vision disorders the same. It's all a problem with focusing light on the retina. I'm not gonna go through and fill in this table with you, but I've created it for you to be a good reminder of, of each of these different vision disorders. So notice I've asked you to fill in what's the easy name for this disorder. I've asked you what structures are causing the problems in this disorder. And finally, I asked you who is generally affected by these disorders. Now, the only one we really talked about the age on was presbyopia. Remember, presbyopia is the old people, like Dr. Aulis. All of the other vision disorders, hyperopia, myopia, and astigmatism, all of those can affect anyone at any point in their life. They're common in children and in adolescents, but presbyopia only seen in older adults. So please take some time to review your notes about each of these different vision disorders. I'm promising you there's gonna be some compare and contrast questions on your quiz and on the exam.